Hey everybody, welcome to Race Amity Day. We're so happy that you're here. My name is Mina Jane. I am the programming librarian at the Cary Library and we're very happy to be bringing this program to you. It seems incredibly special and important right now. Um, I wanted to say we're doing this in collaboration with the Town, Collab Town Celebration Committee, the Lexington Human Rights Coalition, and the Cary Library Foundation. So I'm going to turn this over to Jody Finnegan, who is an organizer for Race Amity Day and the MLK Day, and she's an education chair for ABCL. Thank you so much for being here, and um, let's get started. Hello. Um, <laughs> of all people, I should not have a problem talking about race amity. Um, I have friends of all different races, nationalities, cultures, everything. Um, even gender identities. I, uh, to the point where um, my best friend I've had since I was four is the godchild to uh, the godmother of my child. The child, my godchildren, my children's godparents are two white women and a Puerto Rican. You know, I've got friends of every nationality. But today, for some reason, because of the climate of the day, it's not as easy as it normally would be. It's become very difficult. I'm tired and we're angry. My 83-year-old uncle is a man who walked with MLK back in the day and friends with him is still out fighting in the streets. My grandson and my son are in the streets fighting for justice and I have to worry about them when they leave my house every day. Um, but it's not just here. It's not just one person and it's not even just a hundred. It's the whole world. It's a worldwide problem and a worldwide event. Um, black people in France and in London too and the Aborigines in Australia, they're all affected. George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and um, the rest, because there's a huge list of names, their deaths woke the entire world up. Um, it exposed a blatant system of colorism that, taught, that was taught worldwide. The Europeans' view was chosen to subrogate people of color just to advance their standings. Well, Race Amity is about cultivating friendships and learning new cultures and ways of seeing the world that you wouldn't normally be able to see things. People from different places and different colors all learning from one another. So I must try to stay positive and to say thank you to all that stood with us. Um, we need you. Please continue to stand with us and we appreciate you. But do not be complacent. As we consciously work on building diverse relationships, we need to pay attention to the disparities and to stand up and address them head on. I'd like to introduce Doug Lucenti, the chairman of the Lexington Select Board. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. Thanks for those kind words. Um, uh, this has been a very challenging time for everyone everywhere. Um, and I want to thank you for what you said. That was really, really nice. Um, I also want to thank the Human Rights Committee uh, for the work putting this together and for their advocacy, uh, as well as Cary Library and the Foundation and the Town Celebrations Committee for helping to organize this event today. So I'm going to be reading the proclamation from the Select Board. Whereas Lexington supports a great seal of the United States of America, which bears the inscription E Pluribus Unum, which translates from Latin as out of many, one. And whereas the greatest asset of the town of Lexington is its people. And whereas the town of Lexington is comprised of multicultural, multi-ethnic, and multiracial citizens, and whereas friendship, collegiality, civility, 
respect, and kindness are commonly shared ideals of the collective citizenry of the town of Lexington. And whereas the Towards E Pluribus Unum initiative has invited communities across the United States of America to join in introspection and reflection on the beauty and richness of the diverse peoples of this great nation while reaching out with the spirit of amity toward one another annually on the second Sunday in June. And whereas H 2745 chapter 163 of the Acts of 2015, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts establishes the second Sunday in June annually as Race Amity Day. And whereas on March 23rd, 2017, His Excellency Charles D. Baker, governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts declared the second Sunday in June annually as Race Amity Day and urged all the citizens of the Commonwealth to take cognizance of this event and participate fittingly in its observance. Now, therefore, we, the select board of the town of Lexington, Massachusetts, do hereby recognize the second Sunday in June annually as Race Amity Day, as a day of introspection and reflection on the beauty and richness of the diverse peoples of this great nation while reaching out with the spirit of amity toward one another. Signed by myself, Doug Lucenti, Joe Pato, Susie Barry, Jill Hay, and Mark Sandine. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doug. We really appreciate it that you came out and also Kathleen Lenahan, who we'll see later. I want to do a quick shout out. Thank you to um, our team that put this whole program together um, and to the library, Alyssa Lausen, who created uh, and spent time curating the book list for children and Mina Jane, who is running our program today from the library and also did the book list and the movie list, which will be um, sent to you all after this program. Um, I also wanna thank the Town Celebrations Committee and of course the Cary Library Foundation um, and Feng Ying Wong and Jody Finnegan and Valerie Overton who put together um, all of this programming and Val did the awesome montage photo that you're gonna, or video you're gonna see at the very end and also to our chair, uh, Mona Roy. So thank you all very much. And we're gonna move on by opening with a brief video on the creation of Race Amity and how it got, Race Amity Day and how it got started. So I'm gonna let um, Mina run that program for you and then we're gonna open up and you will all have a chance to talk if you want and share questions and answers. So that's what I'm gonna ask you to use the Q&A at the bottom so that then we can click on you and there's also the raise your hand option. So please use that as well. Thank you all for coming today. I know it's beautiful out and um, we really appreciate you taking the time to be with us. Mina. focus on race amity is that friendship is such a powerful, powerful source of engaging with others and to bring about change. Race amity combined with education is the key to the future of this country. And it's so simple, it's totally overlooked. We forge it saying, well, we gotta get people to do this. We gotta make them do that. And friendship ultimately gets to the heart. And that's really the transformative, lasting impact. Our mission is to advance discourse on race and to promote it through creating friendships and friendship opportunities. We have a range of participants from high school students to world-renowned scholars and professors who come and speak. And we create these relationships, these human relationships. And I love this conference because it always reminds me of the goodness of people 
Just the amount of eagerness to be one human family. The phrase oneness of humanity keeps getting used. And that's, uh, at least from my experience, that's typically a phrase that's used by Baha'is. The more conversations I have, the more people I don't know if they're Baha'i or not, which for me is very affirming. It's, uh, it's affirming of the mission of the Baha'i faith just because this is it's the right time. People are teeming with the feelings of unity and oneness, and they're looking for whatever outlet or space they can uh, find to express it, and that we're not alone on that pathway. Please welcome Governor William Winter. I don't know how so old governor of what at one time probably could be called the most segregated uh, racist state in the nation, could be standing here with these true heroes. But let us not rest on our laurels. Let us not be assured that we are always going to move in the right direction. We will move in the right direction only as enough of us insist that we not slip back. And there are forces of division abroad in the country today that would push us back. And we must not let that happen. You know, what are the critical factors for advancing cross-racial, cross-cultural understanding? I work at public radio. I've always felt like uh, I need to make sure that I understand and sit down to, next to people who are different from me. I grew up that way. My parents are like that. I came up and I was a Medal of, uh, of Honor Award winner last year. And I remember walking away feeling like I need to come back. This was, this is awesome. This is exactly the way I think. There are like a hundred other people who are the same way. Um, it's very gratifying. You know, I used to think that race and racism belong to black and brown people and that as a white person, that my only role uh, in healing racism could be to be friendly or to help and fix people who in fact I had been taught to see as broken or less than. And so waking up white to me means waking up to see that I am right smack in the middle of the story of United States racism and my job is to come in and say, being a good person isn't necessarily enough. Like we really do need to kind of dig into this tragic history in order to face it, work through it, and move beyond it. We have to know each other. We have to learn to live with each other. We have to respect each other. We have to uh, recognize our differences, but respect those differences. Understand that we don't all have to come from the same cultural background or the same ideological background, but we do come from the same background of being a human being. We all members of one race. We are members of the human race. In this work, I've had the opportunity to establish relationships with like-minded people across a number of segments of, of our society, governmental, religious, civic leaders, educators. This has been an extraordinary opportunity for me to engage in my passion, which is steeped in the founding principle of the Baha'i faith, which is the unity and oneness of humankind. And the theme is centered on the idea of amity, of friendship. And of course, this is not an original thought of mine. It is motivated by Abdul Baha and his visit to America and his instructions and encouragement to the American Baha'i community to promote cross-racial friendships, to promote race amity. And in fact, he instructed a couple of Baha'is who organized the first National Race Amity Conference in 1921, which we use to model, of course, the conference that we hold here in the 21st century. The idea, though, of the center was to impact the public discourse on race, to impact it in a way that framed it in a different context, to frame it in the context of human relationships, to imbue it with a spiritual background in terms of engagement and relationships among people. 
I think it is a key to our ability to exist as a great nation, where people understand uh, the diversity of their background and their race, but at the same time, the commonality of their interests, the absolute necessity of learning to respect each other, and to know that out of that understanding will come a relationship, a, a total human relationship that will put down so many of the biases and prejudices that we are still afflicted with. This country is too rich, it's too, has too many great resources, too many great people uh, to be handicapped by a continued racial bias. Amity denotes a relationship. And unless we have a relationship, it's hard for us to engage successfully with one another and to bring about change. Thank you. Feng Ying is going to um, start us with some quick trivia, and then we are going to open for question and answer. Hi. So let's uh, try to have some fun and not to be too serious. Okay. First question is, which continent is the most linguistically diverse in the world? Please add your answers to either the Q&A or raise your hand. Okay. We got any hands? I have Eileen J raised her hand. Okay. Eileen, what is your answer? Eileen. I think she has to unmute herself. Yeah, I think she does. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I figured out how to unmute. All right, awesome. USA. Uh, no, actually it's Africa. The continent is home to about 800 to 1500 of the world's language. Ah, yeah. We had an anonymous um, attendee add that to the Q and A. So good job. Yeah, <laughs> Asia. No, they put Asia. They put Asia. Really? Yeah. Well, Actually, Africa. Yeah. It was in the Q and A, not in the chat. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. So. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Next question. What is an avatar? And where was it originated? You want to repeat the question, Tong Ying? Okay, what is Avatar? And where was it originated? Anybody? Ah, we've got someone. Zaman Q. That's how you come up on my list. Unmute and go ahead and answer. Uh, Japan. It's originated in Japan. Okay. No. Okay, then I don't know. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Try. A anyone else? Anyone else want to give it a try? We have Arun, who's gonna try? Hi, Avatar means reincarnation from India. Yep, that's right. It's a, in Hinduism, it means descent. And it's the material appearance or incarnation of a deity on earth. So you are right. Yes. Congratulations. Yay. Thank you. Okay, next question. What is the very first product Nintendo sold? Anyone? Anyone knows about Nintendo, right? So <laughs> what, what is their very first product? Uh, the, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> we have somebody named Asumi who has an answer. I'm going to say the Nintendo 64. Okay, uh, much earlier. <laughs> Anyone else? Good try, though. Okay, the first product Nintendo sold was back in 1889. It's a playing card called Hanafuda. It can play a variety of games. And Nintendo actually was a card company from 1889 to 1965. It actually, the, the company itself actually has a very interesting story and in, about the playing card. <coughs> if you have time, you can Google about it. Okay, next question. In what country was movable metal type invented? You know, for printing. Okay, I'll re I will repeat the question again. In what country was movable metal type printing invented? Anyone? All right, the answer is. It was invented in Korea about in the early 13th century. It's an improved printing type from the Japanese wooden type in 11th centuries in Song Dynasty. Awesome. We had two China. attendees who thought it might be China. Yeah. Okay. Well, China invented the movable wooden type printing in 11th centuries. But Korea, Korean is the one who invented the metal type, which is improvement from the wooden type, because obviously the, the metal type will last much longer than the wooden type. So, All I right. think we have a question from Steve. Okay. One second. Steve. You have your hand raised, Steve? No, I don't. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, next question. Which country is the largest Muslim country in the world? Anyone? Which country is the largest Muslim country in the world. We have a guess from the question A saying Indonesia. Yes. That's Margaret Heights. Thank you, Margaret. Yeah, uh, Indonesia, 87% of Indonesia's population are Muslims. It accounted for 12.7% of the world's Muslim. The next one is uh, Pakistan for 11% and India for uh, Ten point nine percent, and about twenty percent of Muslims live in Arab countries, and of course the the rest just sp spread out the rest of the world. Okay, next question: 
who were the first to make hot chocolate? Everyone was hot cocoa, right? Do you know who made it first? Catherine's got a guess. Catherine? Anyone? Hmm. Catherine or Someone, yeah, oh Catherine wrote Mexico. Yes. The Maya Mexican Mexico. Oh, yeah. The, the Mayans in Mexico, I should say, they start have a hot chocolate back in five hundred BC. They made the drink from grounded coca seeds with water, cornmeal, and chili peppers. So I that's awesome. Yeah, it's delicious. <laughs> Linda also got that one right. Thank you both. Oh, okay. Uh, next one is about history, too. Before Rosa Park, which African American also refused to give up her seat in the public tra transportation, on public transportation? That's way before Rosa Park. Anyone? Alyssa says Claudette Colvin. Uh, no. Anyone? That is a correct answer. That is a correct answer. Claudette Colvin was a pregnant woman. Who, who within six months before Harriet, before um, the first lady did it, before Rosa Parks, she um, actually did. Okay, my, my research says it was a journalist. Her name is Ida Well Barnett. Ida B. Wells. Okay, uh, she refused to give up her real car seat for a white man back in 1884. Mm -hmm. So if your person is six months before Rosa Park, I think uh, this uh, Ida lady was way before she did. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> anyway, to continue the story, she refused to uh, give up her real car seat for a white man, and she bit the conductor on the hand when, she, when he tried to force her to give up her seat. So she, uh, later on, she sued the railroad company and initially won, but then the decision was overturned later by a higher court. So I guess uh, after the meeting, we have uh, some homework to do, you know, and try to sort out exactly who is the earliest one. But anyway. Okay, next question. Who is the sequoia tree named after? Will you repeat that one again? Who is the sequoia tree named after? Hmm. Ah, Catherine Riley, a Native American, but I don't know specifics. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. Yeah. Close enough. Uh, the Sequoia tree is named in honor of the Cherokee leader Sequoia, who helped his people to de develop an alphabet for their language. So, awesome. yeah. That's awesome. We also have an anonymous attendee who said a Cherokee Native American named Sequoia. Yes. Yep. Awesome. Thank okay. you both. And we actually have some good um, comments about the, la the la question before last about Claudette uh -huh. Colvin, that she was one of the founders of NAACP. And Jody says, yep, that's her. Okay. Awesome. All right, so. No, 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 not Claudette Colvin. Ida B. Wells. Ida B. Wells was a, a founder of the NAACP. Um, Claudette Coben 
they chose not to use her as the face for that um, boycott because she was pregnant. She was a 16 year old pregnant girl. Uh, so right. when um, Rosa Parks decided to do it, they used Rosa Parks. She was a secretary for the NAACP. Oh, thank you so much for that um, clarification. Ida B. Wells was the founder of NAACP. Got it. Okay, are we ready for the next one? The question is, which country in the world has the first LGBTQ person as its head of the state? Anyone have any idea that which country in the world has the first LGBTQ person as its head of the state? Margaret says New Zealand and Catherine says Denmark. And okay, Tina says Ireland. Yep. Do you know the the time when they elect it's a because Denmark currently I'm sorry? Denmark is currently. Currently. Okay, but, but which country ha has it first? Ah. I don't know. Okay. It's Ireland. Mm. They, elect, they elect the first LGBTQ person as their prime minister in 2009, and her name. I can only say the first name is uh, Johanna. I Googled the pronunciation of her last name, but as much as I tried, I couldn't reproduce, so my apologies. So if you want to know her full name, please uh, Google it afterwards. Several people are wondering if it was Iceland, but it was yeah. Ireland, you're saying? Iceland, Iceland. Uh, in 2009. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, she only had one term, so it's from 2009 to 2013. Did you spell her last name? Okay, it's S the same, I-G-U-R-O-R-B-O-P-P-I-R, and the first name is Johanna, J-O-H-A-N-N-A. Thank you. Okay, the next question. Which number is considered unlucky by Chinese and some other Asian people? Which number is not lucky for Chinese? Someone says, anonymous attendee, four. Yes. Yeah. Tina thinks it's eight. Okay, the correct answer is four. And the reason is because it sounds very similar to death, you know, in many Chinese dialect, and I think also in Korean. So they also consider number four is an unlucky number. You know, I don't know how things are now because I've been away from Taiwan for over 30 years. But back then, you're not going to see, say, forceful, or room number four in the hospital or in the hotel. And then back in 1997, when Hong Kong was going back to China, a lot of people from Hong Kong migrated to Canada. And then they would make the developer change the street number before they buy the house if it so happened and at four. Okay, next question. Which country was the first country in Southeast Asia to gain independence after World War II in 1945? Anyone? Which country in Southeast Asia is the first one to gain independence. 
after World War II. Okay, the answer is Philippines. It also the only majority Christian nation in Asia. 80% of its population are Roman Catholic. Okay. Next one. Uh, Last question, Feng Ying. I'm watching our time. Okay. All right. Okay, so, okay, last question. Okay, as much as we celebrate our difference, we also celebrate what we have in common. So does anyone know how many human bones we have as an adult? Come on, we learned this in uh, middle school or even uh, elementary school. We have a raised hand. Okay. Hang on. I got two raised hands. Okay. Let's see here. My Q and A is coming up. Um, Arun, go ahead. Uh, two hundred six. Yes. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, this wrap up our trivia question and thank you very much for participating. Thank you very much. I am going to open the floor for some conversation. We're going to ask um, a few people to share some race amity stories and I'm going to start um, with Christina Lynn. Are you here, Christina? Let's see, I'm gonna make sure if you are here that you are unmuted and unmute yourself. Hi guys. Hi. You, you can hear me now. Okay. Yes, thank you. Well, thanks for hosting this. This is fantastic. I really enjoyed that video in the beginning. And I, I don't remember learning the number of bones in my body, but <laughs> good to know. <laughs> 206. Um, so my race amity story was um, I th just that several years ago, um, someone had organized this event of, about racism um, and was all about um, creating a, an opportunity for a town um, citizens to get together and talk about issues of race in the town and it was it was um, host uh, it was run through the YWCA um, and I think it was a really um, I don't, it was my first time really start as an adult understanding racism better but more importantly I think it was just really neat to see um, a whole room of people from all different backgrounds coming together uh, and sharing um, their own perspectives. Um, and um, I think working together to come up with some ideas on how we could individually as well as, um, as, a, as a town work together to, to make some strides. So I guess that was my that was my story. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, Valerie Overton, I believe you have a story to share as well. And then we're going to open to the broader group here as well. Hi. Uh, thanks, Tanya. So uh, my story has to do with kind of meeting a variety of people at our Lexington Pride celebration a couple of years ago. Um, we, we really work hard to ensure that our events are inclusive and at this particular Pride I met a couple of uh, people who were uh, new to town and, uh, and, uh, and a people of a variety of races. But uh, these two men, Larry and Charles, who happen to be black, and uh, Matt, who happens to be white, we have developed um, a really nice friendship after meeting them. And we have worked on a variety of social justice uh, projects since then. 
uh, three of us are now town meeting members and most recently the four of us worked together to organize the March for Racial Justice that took place a week or so ago. So um, you never know when chance encounters might lead to a really lovely friendship with um, that is both satisfying personally as well as uh, leading to action on racial justice as well. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Does anyone else, um, if you put your raise your hand in the Q and A, we can click on you, and uh, that would be really great. I see. Um, I think where it just went away. Arun, it looks like you have something. I'm gonna. Make sure you can talk here. Go ahead, you should be able to talk and share with us, Arun. Hi, this is Nagashri Chakka, Lexington team lead. Uh, we are a group of 70 volunteers making personal protective equipment to serve the needy and the frontline uh, staff. With me is Arun Kodumuru, the youth leader for ACOM Boston Youth. Uh, we have experience to share here. Thank you, welcome. Thank you so much for joining. Tell us your story. So recognizing the need of the hour, I called for volunteers to make PPE and surprisingly within two days, I get about 40 to 50 volunteers who came together most of them are strangers to, to make and supply PPE. And very, so very soon we got into a group of 80 people, 25 Suez, about six people helping out with the cutting and many more donors and volunteers who were crocheting, making 3D bands, making the caps for the hospitals, making the disposable guns and making the face shields. We have more than 50 youth volunteers and 70 uh, adult volunteers in this effort working through next Lexington Coalition Group. We have people from different ethnicities, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Africa, and China, and probably there are a few more that I'm not aware because we are all strangers to each other and I didn't even get to see them in person. But this was an amazing journey of two and a half months for me. We have made over 6,000 masks, made over 1,100 crochet bands, made over 500 face shields, made over 1,000 disposable gowns, made over 300 3D printed mask securers. I can't thank people coming with the common goal of serving people like us who are trying to make sure we are safe. Thank you for giving us this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you for all you all have done and your whole team and group. And I really appreciate you sharing that story. Um, I think Margaret is next. Margaret, did you have your hand up? Do you want to share your story? Uh, yes, my story is that a couple of years ago, I um, received an email from Encore, which is an organization that uh, for uh, retired people. And uh, it's a, and it was an invitation to join a project uh, of, um, of older citizens to become mentors in the classroom, in a classroom in Boston. Um, and specifically, I went to Hyde Park, and there might be other people on this call who were part of this as well. But I spent, oh gosh, um, I think I was there from September, end of September to, uh, to uh, December, uh, two days a week uh, with two different uh, classes. Um, and it was uh, a mixed heritage uh, classroom. Um, and uh, I had such, I enjoyed the experience so much. And um, it was, I was invited to come back the next year um, outside of the Encore program um, to come and, um, uh, be a mentor as well with the same teacher and I was so gratified uh, when I went into the school and one of the kids from the um, previous year saw me in the hallway mm -hmm. and, and crossed over the crowd of students and gave me a big hug. Oh, I have to tell you um, 
I'll treasure that moment my, you know, the rest of my life. It was, it was really wonderful. And I enjoyed the teaching experience. And in fact, I feel that perhaps I missed my calling because I really loved being with those kids. So That's thanks. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think we probably have time for one more. Jesse, do you want to share? Sure. Hi. Hi. Um, hello. Um, what comes to my mind is when Lexington in 2013 celebrated the tercentennial, the 300th anniversary, Kathleen, who I know is on the panel, um, helped organize one of the events and it was a dance around the world. And yeah. what, we did, what we did was um, reach out to people in different cultural groups in town, people of different nationalities, different ethnicities, different races. And the, key part was that there were dances from colonial times and modern times, but there was this really special dance, a fusion dance, and Melanie Lynn and Gita Padaki organized it with Jay Shree, and it was, you, you looked at all these different people doing their own separate cultural dance, and then she organized a dance that everyone participated in, and they called it the fusion dance. I know a lot of people who didn't know each other made friends through planning those events. And some of those leaders have now become like in town meeting or are helping run some of the community organizations. So I thought that moment was exquisite to celebrate not just our revolutionary past, but also the rich diversity that's here right now. That's awesome. Thank you so much. I remember that then and dancing was fun too. I remember that. It seems like a long time ago, but I agree. I see that was an awesome, that was an awesome event that Lexington put on. And look at all the amazing people within our own community that we have that we can connect with. So thank you. Um, does anyone else, do, do anyone else have a quick one they want to share before we move on? If you just raise your hand in the, um, participants list, then we can see you, because I think we have a few more minutes. Anybody? Everybody's awfully quiet. Okay, I'm going to say thank you to everyone. I want to thank um, Actually, Tanya, uh, we do have one more. Oh, good. Yay. Effie? Yeah, I just wanted to bring to people's attention getting involved with Habitat for Humanity, uh, which is an international uh, building group of all kinds of ethnic backgrounds and religious backgrounds, culture backgrounds especially getting multi-generations to take on one of these groups and help to build homes. It was a tremendous experience in Trinidad to work with a, a three-generation family to build their home a few years ago. Um, and Habitat for Humanity also works locally to work with um, people of different communities and races. So I can just um, encourage families to look it up and consider working locally. It's um, quite an amazing experience in terms of getting to know people one-on-one -on -one, uh, during a day's project. That's Effie, my is, is there a connection here in Lexington that people could reach out to? Uh, I can, I'd have to look it up. I know there's Massachusetts. One of the people who was on earlier with a question and answer who I know has a lot of contacts so I could get it back to somebody um, if you want me to. So I, I do know how to get access to that. Okay, so if anyone is interested in that, um, why don't you go ahead and reach out to um, our email at the Human Rights Committee and Ethi, if you'd be so kind as to put your um, email in somewhere so we can reach back out to you, that would be awesome. Okay, I'll put into chat. Awesome, thank you so much. That's even better. If okay, I can. <laughs> we, have, um, we have a quick photo montage and we also have some action. And we have one more person, Kathleen Lenahan is our new school committee chair, has generously um, agreed to sit and give her, spend her time with us this afternoon as well. And she's going to close with um, the proclamation. And then we're going to jump back on really quick and finish up with our photo montage and our action. So I'm going to let Kathleen get on here. 
and read her proclamation and I'm gonna get out of the way. Great, um, I just wanna thank everybody from the Human Rights Committee and Curry Library and everyone who helped put this together. Uh, given all of the, what seems like a constant stream of bad news, it's just really great to feel uplifted today. So, uh, whereas Lexington supports the great seal of the United States of America, which bears the inscription E Pluribus Unum, which translates from Latin as out of many one, and whereas the greatest asset of the town of Lexington is its people, and whereas the town of Lexington is comprised of multicultural, multi-ethnic, and multiracial citizens, and whereas friendship, collegiality, civility, respect, and kindness are commonly shared ideals of the collective citizenry of the town of Lexington, and whereas the Towards E Pluribus Unum initiative has invited communities across the United States of America to join in introspection and reflection on the beauty and richness of the diverse peoples of this great nation while reaching out with the spirit of amity toward one another annually on the second Sunday in June, and whereas H2745, Chapter 163 of Acts of 2015 of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, establishes the second Sunday in June annually as Race Amity Day, and whereas on March 23, 2017, His Excellency Charles D. Baker, Governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, declared the second Sunday in June annually as Race Amity Day, and urged all the citizens of the Commonwealth to take cognizance of this event and participate fittingly in its observance, now, therefore, the Lexington School Committee does hereby proclaim the second Sunday in June annually as Race Amity Day as a day of introspection and reflection on the beauty and richness of the diverse peoples of this great nation while reaching out with the spirit of amity toward one another, signed by myself and Eileen Jay, Sarah Cuthbertson, Deepa Kasani, and Scott Boken. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Thank you everyone for joining. I have a couple of quick, I know Mona Roy wants to do a quick announcement. We were gonna put up the action list of things that you can do, actions that you can take to promote race amity for yourself and for your friends and family. So I think um, Mina's gonna post that and we're gonna, then after that, we're gonna do a quick video montage. Um, do you wanna put that up and then I'll let Mona, Mona jump on. There we go. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, I just wanted to thank thank everybody. Um, uh, thank everyone for coming. And um, I wanted to especially thank um, someone who wasn't thanked, which is Tanya Gisalfi, our vice chair, who works tirelessly for the committee and who um, organized uh, this, who really organized the subgroup, um, which was Fong Ying Hong. Um, Jody Finnegan and Valerie Overton, grateful to all of these people. We know that this was a relatively short program compared to last year, and we look forward to the time when we can be in a room together and meet in person. But we really appreciate everyone coming today. The Human Rights Committee is very excited not only to bring you this program, but also to be a co-sponsor of Lex Pride's wonderful uh, Lex Pride, Pride in Lexington Day. And today we're going to have a car parade and we will be meeting at the uh, Department of Public Works, I believe at 2.30 to, um, in our cars so we can safely socially distance and then have just a car parade down Mass Avenue to about Wilson Farm. So we look forward to those of you who would like to come to that to please join because I think we're very fortunate in Lexington to have a wonderful inclusive community. You And you saw from our leadership, whether it's uh, Doug Lucente or Kathleen Lenahan, that both on the town side and the school side, that um, they they respect and embrace race amity. And um, Tanya, I, I don't know if any, if I know that this race amity actions item, this these ideas can be sent out as well, but we hope that you'll consider taking these actions and many more. We're going to put them on our website. Mina is going to send them out along with book lists. And I, that reminds me, I, I wanna again thank the library. I think these programs run smoothly because the library not only has helped us with all of the technological things, but they are very much our partners in, in the equity work that we do in Lexington. So very grateful for that. And anyway, I think that's, I think I've taken just about too much time. So we'll go to the photo montage and I think we'll be done. Yeah. Just thank you all so much for joining us. And um, thank you, Mona, our chair. And I just want to leave with this. True peace is not merely the absence of tension. It's the presence of justice. Of course, that's ML, 
Martin Luther King Jr. And um, if we think that, if we focus on that more, I think we will find ourselves uh, understanding a lot more about what's going in our society today. Okay, photo montage. Thank you all for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. 